This is a very, very simple question. And it's a question that when I answer it, you're going to go, oh, my God, oh. You, you know, you're going to love. You know, it is so simple. It, it reflects what we have been teaching for how many years? I asked you a question. At, at salvation, there was a positional change. All you had to do was reflect on the positional change. The scripture calls it moving from the, the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. How did we do that? Okay. Okay, that's what the traditional church would say. We receive the Holy Ghost. Now, what is the operation of that? What, what is the, what is the operation? What, it, what makes it physical? What? What makes it physical? Okay, we got all these pieces now. The old man died. We died at salvation. Uh, circumcision of the flesh. Okay, I got all these pieces now. And so, if, so you know, if, if, if you were being offered a million dollars to answer this question, oh, my God, I would, I, would, I would just destroy every one of you. You couldn't come home. Glory to God. Leave all that money there that the church could use. <laughs> Amen. Oh, Really? Okay, what did you just say? Listen, put the two together. What did you say? Oh, really? Who's placed in Christ? The what? The soul is placed where? So where is it taken from? Out of the what? Out of the flesh. The soul is taken out of the flesh and put where? Where is it put? In the spirit. What's the scripture? Because you can't, you, can't, you can't make statements like that if you're not able to back them up. Hmm? Let's look at... Let's look at Romans. Come on, guys. See, I, I want to make sure you all understand this. You got to know this. You got to know salvation like you know your name. We should understand salvation. We cannot bring in the masses. We cannot evangelize properly unless we understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. The church has been in darkness too long because it, it has not the knowledge of the gospel. We need to understand the knowledge of the gospel. You're not going to be successful in evangelism, in evangelism or in, in um raising a flock of people, if you don't understand the message. you got to understand the mystery of Christ. This is the mystery of Christ manifested. Glory to God. This is the mystery of Christ. Now let's look at, let's, let's, follow, the, let's follow the, let's connect these dots here. Let's go into Romans um, 7. You want to go there first? Look at this. Look at 7 and um, 5. What does this say? Everybody read it. For when we were where? In the flesh, what happened? The motions of sin, which were by the law, it worked where? In our members to do what? To bring forth fruit unto death. When we were, when the, when the scripture refers to we, what is, this, what is, what is the we here? Of course, we, start, we are the subject matter, the saints. But when our what? When our soul, when our soul resided in the flesh. When God made Adam, he said he was made of what? Living what? Soul. The last Adam was what? What? A quickening spirit. So just as we bore the image of the first, we shall bear, we have, we're bearing now the image of the second. Is that right? So we are no longer living souls now. We're what? 
quickening spirits. How did we become a quickening spirit? When we were in the flesh, what does that mean? That means the same thing that God, that Paul said, God made man, the first man, Adam, was a living what? Soul. What does that mean? He, what did his soul live? What did, what did Adam's soul live? In his, in his flesh, in his body, right? His soul lived in the body. Is that right? That's what this is saying. When we were in the flesh. So when the soul resides in the flesh, that's a living soul. That's the distinction between salvation and the lack of salvation. When, when, when one is saved, he, he, when one is unsaved, his soul resides in the flesh. Right? Now, when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin worked in our, which were by the law, worked where? In our members. So because we were in the flesh and because we were under captivity, who was, what caused us to be in captivity? Who, what was the spirit? Spirit of iniquity caused us, the evil concupiscence, to work where? In our members. That's why, this, that's why Jesus said he came to set the captives free. And that's why this man, this, this man in the seventh chapter of Romans sa said that when I would do good, evil was what? Forever present. This is an unsaved individual, right? This is, this is, a, this is the lack of salvation because he starts out when we were in the flesh. Now look at chapter 8. Let's go over to chapter 8. Look at, is that my mic? It is? Okay. I'm not moving. I'm not doing anything. Okay, now. Now notice what it says over here in Romans 8. Are you with me? Look at the 8th verse, Romans 8 and 8. What does it say? Let's read it again. So, now did we not read in the 7th chapter when it says, when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin came forth and brought forth fruit unto death? But now look what it says in the 8th chapter. So then they that are where? In the flesh cannot do what? Cannot please God. Look at the ninth verse. What does the ninth verse say? But ye are not where? You're not where? We're not in the flesh, but where? We are not in the flesh, but where? Is that not a positional change? Is that not a physical change? Does that mean that God literally took the soul out of the flesh and placed it where? In the spirit. And then the spirit was placed in the flesh. So we were literally taken out of the flesh and placed in the Holy Ghost. Is that right? We were placed in the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost was placed in the flesh. Does that make sense? Hello? So now, now, does, do, now do, do we understand what the scripture means when it says in him we live and move and have our what? Being. What is our being? What is the being? I can't hear you. The soul. Don't be afraid to say that. Your being is your soul. You were a living soul. God saved us. He saved us. Each, each and every one of us were a soul. We were souls that lived in our bodies. We lived in this flesh. Then God saved us. He took us out of the flesh, put us in the spirit, and then put the spirit back in the flesh. Isn't that something? But why is that important? Or why is that significant for me to, for me to take note of that? Why is it, why is it for me to, so significant for me to take note of the fact that I am no longer in the flesh but in the spirit? Okay, a scripture says that, that we are seated with him in a heavenly place, in heavenly places. Is that right? The Holy Ghost is that heavenly place. It's omnipresent. Are y'all working with me? Hello? But why is it so significant for us to not be in the flesh? And the Holy Spirit is in the flesh. Why don't we, why doesn't the scripture says, 
Notice what the scripture said. The scripture said, you are, said those who are in the flesh can't please God. But you are not in the flesh, if so be that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Is that right? You are not in the flesh, but where? In the Spirit. So we live in the Spirit. That's where our being is. It has been placed in the Holy Ghost. Are you with me? Our being has been placed inside of the Holy Spirit. Now, being in the Holy Ghost, what is the significance of that? Why is that so important for me to understand that I'm in the Holy Spirit and I'm not in the flesh? Because now the Spirit, the Holy Ghost, is in the flesh. Why don't I just consider myself in the flesh? Why would Paul make these statements like, the life that I live, it is not I that, the life that I live in the flesh, it is not I that live, but it is who? Christ that does what? Liveth in me. When we were in the flesh, before we met God, we had ownership. We had ownership of this body. Come on. Did we not? We had ownership. But now that we're in the spirit and the spirit lives in the flesh. Huh? Because how was this fresh flesh resurrected? It was resurrected at, at salvation by what? By the spirit of God, right? Because it literally died. Old man died and was resurrected in who? In and by Christ Jesus. So if Christ lives in the flesh, guess who has ownership now? Christ has ownership of our flesh. So now this body is literally what? The body of who? Of Christ. That's the body of Christ. Your body is literally the body of Christ. It belongs to him. That's what's important. It's important for us to understand. It's important for us to realize that our ownership has, has been passed on now. The ownership has been passed on to Christ. He owns this body. He paid for it. He died for it. Is that right? So now he lives in the flesh and we live in him. Hello? Hello? But now we have, what, what do we have? What is our role? What, what did he give us regarding the flesh? Stewardship. What does a steward do? Huh? Yes, sir. Right? He, he, he takes care of money. He takes care of a body, too, doesn't he? He takes care of this body until he takes care of it for the who? For the owner, for the master. Mm -hmm. So we have stewardship. Why were we given stewardship? Why were we given stewardship of the flesh? Yes, sir. What's the main purpose of, of us actually having stewardship? Because Christ owns the body. It belongs to him. But he gave us stewardship. Why? So, number one, we could be a witness. Okay, we could be a witness. Okay, that's what we do. That's what we do. But why, why, why else? Anybody? Why are we stewards? Yes. It's us that people know. Well, the body didn't change its looks, did it? We just got a glow about us, right? <laughs> but why is it we have stewardship? What was the purpose of giving us the right or the ability of choice? What was so that we can willingly serve him by choice? So stewardship is given to us for what? So if we can choose, we, huh? We can choose to sin or not sin, right? So what is that? So what is God doing? He hands us over stewardship of this flesh. So you can do what you want to do now. You can serve me or you can not serve me. So what is that? So what is it for? What is that whole operation there for? 
testing, testing, trying. No one is going to heaven except they've been tried, tested, and approved of God. No one. No one is going to heaven except they be tried, tested, and approved of God. And the only way you're going to be approved of God, you're going to have to, you're going to have to go through testing, trials. You're going to be tried and tested. And so now with stewardship, I can decide to obey. He's not going to usurp authority. Why? Because I've got to prove myself worthy of the kingdom. Is that right? So do we understand a transitional change? Now, we understand that the transitional change brought us from the darkness to the light, and it was an actual physical change because we were taken out of the flesh and placed in the spirit, and the spirit placed in the flesh. That means now I no longer own the flesh, this is not my ownership now. I do not have ownership of this body. The body belongs to Christ. And even in one scripture, Paul said, the body belongs to God. That the body is God's. Did not the scripture say if a man sin, if he, if he sin with a harlot, he, he take the members of Christ and join them to a harlot. Did not he say that? Amen. So the body now belongs to God or to Christ. It is not ours. But we have the stewardship for trying, for testing, for exercising choice because God wants us to freely and willingly obey him. And if we choose not to obey him, we choose to go to hell. That's our right. We have the right and the privilege to go to hell. But if we choose to serve him, it has to be by choice and not because he forced us to. Amen? Any questions? Any questions? This is the opportunity. Yes, sir. Um, so, question. If we were just given stewardship of the body, so our soul is in Christ and Christ mm -hmm. is in the body, mm -hmm. and we're just here as stewards, as a witness, um, what then is the purpose of of like learning how to how to walk in the spirit. How can you be a steward of righteousness if you don't know righteousness? Okay? You have to be taught you have to be taught what righteousness really is when it comes down to um, working working in 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 this in in this temple. You know, actually taking this temple into situations, taking this temple into servitude. We have to know what are the what are the what are the rules of the game? What are the rules of engagement? We, uh, you know, if if I didn't know that I had to love my enemy, I might be tempted not to love him. So, teaching me that I that if when you tell me I can love my enemy, right? You know what that does? You know what that does? Any principle of God that is taught, what it does, it tells you, the principle tells you the power of your salvation. All right? So now, it, what it does is the teaching now gives you an expectation that you would not have had without the teaching. So the teaching says, I can love an enemy. So how would, you wouldn't even expect to love your enemy if I didn't teach you of, if the, if, if God didn't teach you uh, that you could love your enemy, you wouldn't even expect to love your enemy. And even now with all the teaching, the church does not expect to love its enemies. Most people in the church don't love their enemies. But the teaching says that we can. So now when, when you don't love an enemy, guess what? You realize that you are not living up to the potential of your salvation. You realize that you, are, you have lessened you have lessened the power of your salvation in your own heart, in your own mind, in your own operation. You are not doing what the scripture tells you to do or what you, even what the scriptures say you are capable of doing. Because the teachings of Christ, the, the, the principles of Christ inform us of the power of our salvation 
and the expectancy. We now, it creates an expectancy in us. For instance, if you didn't, if, if, um, if we were teaching uh, faith moves God, faith moves God. Now, you would not know, you would not have an expectancy to see God move if you were waiting for him, if you were, had your faith focused on God, you would not have that expectation if you were not taught that. So you, so you have to be taught the principles of God so, so that you'll even have an expectation of the power of your salvation. Good question. Very good question. Anyone else? Anyone else? This is the time to ask your questions now. Yes, ma'am. I can't hear you, just a moment. When you move from the flesh to a salvation, it's no longer like the devil, like you can't bring the devil or you sinning, it's like your choice. That is so true. Once you, are, once you have been born again mm -hmm. and Christ actually lives in you, I'm not talking about just give your hand to the, to the preacher and say you're saved and all of that. I'm talking about a, an actual experience of holiness with God where, where the Holy Spirit actually comes in to live inside of you. We have no more excuses for sin. No more, there's no demons that lurk over us and pressure us and make us do anything wrong. The Bible says that we have overcome the world. We have overcome the devil. We've overcome all the power of the devil. So the devil has no ability to force us to do anything. Now, in the seventh chapter of Romans, he was forcing that man to do stuff. That man said, when I want to do good, evil is present. He said, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. My heart want to do what's right. But I see another law working where? In my what? In my members, bringing me into, the ca into captivity and bringing forth death inside of me. Evil concupiscence was working within the individual that did not know God. We don't have that excuse anymore because with salvation came an eviction. Right? God evicted the spirit of iniquity, which was living in us, according to Ephesians 2. Is that right? The spirit that worked in the children of disobedience, that spirit was evicted because God is not going to share this body with the devil. He's not gonna. He's not gonna live in one side and the devil live on the other. God doesn't do that. God said this. This is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Is that right? So if it's the temple of the Holy Ghost, now if we sin, we sin by what? Choice. We sin by choice. And so I can choose to live holy every day of my life. I can get up every day and decide that I'm going to obey God today in all things at all times. No matter what comes my way, I'm going to obey God. I'm going to do what God would, would, has dictated for me to do. I can do that today. I can do that tomorrow. I can do it the next day, the next day, the next day. I can do it forever. I can choose to obey God forever. And that's called perfection. Choosing to obey God in all things at all time is perfect. That's, that's perfection. Now, does God expect us to be perfect? Yes, God expects us to be perfect. Is that right? Did he, not, did he expect Adam to be perfect? Did he not expect Adam to be perfect? He said, the day you disobey me, you're going to do what? Die. But now if Adam had not disobeyed him, he would have lived how long? Forever. He never would have died. So God expected him to be perfect every day of his life. Perfection simply means I choose not to disobey God. That's all perfection is. I choose to obey God in all things at all times. Amen? And every saint can do that. Now, if you're not saved, you can't do it because the enemy, Lord God, has power over you. Amen? Question. Any other question? All right, now. He's a little far from the subject that we're on right now. If you are saved... Can you um, get possessed by the enemy? No, you cannot. Oh, I thought so. I no. thought no, because that would be dual nature. That's right. Okay. There's no dual nature in God. We have, bec we have been made partakers of the divine nature. Glory to God. There's not two natures in us. There's not one nature of the flesh and one nature of the spirit. Let me tell you why. Did not you say that the Holy Spirit lives in the, in the flesh? 
Did not we just say that, that the flesh belongs to God? It's the temple of God. So, if, so the, the, the nature comes from the spirit that is within it. Are you, are you saying the nature of a creature is based upon the spirit that occupies the creature? God is the one that has given us divine nature. What does that mean? That means that when I got saved, think about it. When you got saved, did you want to sin? It doesn't matter how much sin we had committed. We could have been in the club last night. We could have been in fornicate, on a, in a bed of fornication before we came to church and got saved. But the moment you got saved, you didn't desire that anymore. Is that right? What happened? Your nature changed. Your nature changed. It, your, the nature of the flesh changed. It did not crave sin anymore. That was the power and the strength of sin before we got saved. We had the nature of Satan. Did not Jesus say, you are of your father who? The devil and whose lust? His lust you will do. So he created lust in our members. So our body craved sin. Is that right? But then after salvation, God occupied, put, kicked out the spirit of iniquity. Now he takes over the flesh. You think he's going to create? He's going to take over something and then create sin in it or create a desire to sin? No. This flesh does not desire to sin. It does not desire to sin. So when it does, when it does sin, it's by choice. By the soul. The soul chooses. Flesh does not choose to sin. The flesh has always been under the power of man in the garden. Flesh was under the control of Adam's soul. After that, after the fall of man, flesh has either been under the power of Satan or under the power of God. Amen? That's why we were captive, because we, we couldn't help ourselves. Question. Any other questions? Doc, you were taking us through the explanation or of, of ministering that physical transition at mm -hmm. salvation. Is what you just minister as far as the nature change? Is that the explanation? Is that how we would minister the spiritual change of salvation? Well, what I was what I was asking the question that I asked was how did the transition become a physical transition? And the answer was that we were actually literally, physically taken out of the flesh and placed in the spirit, in the Holy Ghost, and then the Holy Ghost placed in the flesh. Now, the scripture says that our life is where? Is where? Hid where? In Christ, in God. Our life is hid with Christ in God. So that's a physical change because our life was in the flesh. The soul was just in the flesh. That's why we were called a living soul. But now we are what? Quickening spirit. Why? Because we are one with who? One with God. One with Christ. Amen. Question. She, he's going to bring you a microphone. Okay, you were saying a little earlier when you were responding to him about um, how we have to as, as children of God, even though we're born again and placed in the spirit, we have to learn this life. When the scripture says Christ learned obedience mm -hmm. by the things he suffered, mm -hmm. can you explain that as it relates to even us being in, in obedience and, and, and allowing our, using our bodies to obey God? Okay. Well, when, when you got to remember something about Christ Jesus. This was a unique and first-time experience for him. This was a unique and first-time experience. Christ had never been in flesh. Remember that. He had never been subjected to the flesh. Never, ever been subjected to the flesh. So, and not only that, he was subjected to flesh that was even lower than the angels. Remember that? The scriptures say he was made a little lower than the angels so that he could die for the suffering of death. So now, he, now he's placed in a body that is not even as powerful as angels. 
and placed in a hostile environment where everything on the planet just about hates him. And he has to go inside of a, an environment and change a worship system that's been in existence for over 3,000 years. And his whole birth was surrounded with controversy. So he, he, he's batting a thousand here. Everything is, is against him. Everything is against him. But now, suffering all of those things, he learned how to obey God even in the midst of all of that suffering. Suffering humiliation. Remember when he was talking to the disciples? Uh, no, he was talking to the scribes and Pharisees. And they said, and he, and he, he, he told them, he said something to them, and they got upset. And they said, well, at least we weren't, we're not a child of fornication. They were calling him a bastard. They were saying that, that his mother committed fornication to bring him forth. He suffered that. Now, what, was the, what does that mean, he suffered that? That means that Philippians 2 came into to being there. He thought it not robbery to be what? Equal with God. In other words, he brought forth the character of God and, other, and actually, he did not just bring forth the character of God. He allowed God the Father to continue to work through him. That's what equal with God means. He allowed God to work through him. So much so, until when somebody says, show us the Father, he said, have I been so long with you and you still don't what? You won't don't what? You don't know me? I've been here all this time and you don't know me. Hmm? So... So what is, what, is he, what, is, what is the scripture saying? The scripture is saying that Jesus had to learn. He had to learn. He had to learn obedience by the things that he suffered. He, un, he learned the power of obedience. He learned that if I just obey the Father, if I stay on task, if I stay on point, if I, if I allow God, if I allow God to work through me, if I remain equal with God in character, if I remain equal with God so that the Father can work through me, he learned the power of that. And notice one time he said, someone asked him, say, well, why, how can you do all of this stuff? And he said, because the Father loved me. And the Father loves me because I always do those things that do what? Please the Father. Yeah. He learned obedience by the things he had to go through. He learned the power of obedience. He learned that you can trust God. You can trust the Father. If the Father tell you something, and the Father is always with me. Remember he said, that my fa I'm not alone. My Father is with me. He did, and he bears witness of me. You see? Glory to God. Question. Are we learning? Amen. Yes, ma'am? You got a question? Jesus was born of the Holy Spirit. He was born the Son of God. Yeah. He, in the, if you want to say saved when he was born, yeah. He was born the Son of God. That's why he was an example. He was born to be an example of what we would be once we got saved. Mm -hmm. However, when he, when, he, when he was arrested, he took on sin. So he had to die and be born again. When he died, when he was resurrected from the dead, that's born again. Okay? All right? Any other question? See, and, and, and that made him, that made him the, um, that made him the, exam the example in all things. That made him the example he was, he was our example in every sense of the word example because once he took on sin, he had to die. And once he, went, how did he die? He died carrying the sins of the world and did not uh, Luke write in the book of Acts and also David wrote in the, in the Psalms that this day I have begotten thee again. So he was begotten again from the dead. First, he's the first 
born from the what? Dead. So he was born again. Again. He was born again. Jesus was born again after the crucifixion. Question. Any other questions? Um, you know how you said Jesus was born saved? So like if our parents are like saved and we were born it's like, do we have to choose salvation even though, like, someone, I remember someone ministering that the Holy Ghost, like, the seed of the Holy Ghost, when we are born, like, you know, we can, like, I don't know if it's, like, saved or something, but we have to choose whether or not we're going to receive God in the end. Well, the Bible says that if the unbelieving husband uh, is choose to stay with the wife, the, the believing wife, and if the unbelieving wife choose to stay with the believing husband, God says that union is considered holy because greater is the seed of God, all right, than, this, than that which is in the world. So and the scripture declares, Paul said to the church at Corinth, that your children are born holy in such a union. Holy has a definition that was given to us in Romans, the 12th chapter, holy, holiness means acceptable unto God. So that which is acceptable unto God is considered holy. Now, because a child is born with a righteous seed, now, because, let, let's watch it. If Satan was powerful enough to get in, in Adam and pass his seed down to every creature, right? Is not God's seed more powerful? Did he not say that greater seed is in you now than he does in the world? So is not God's seed more powerful? So what God did, when God got in the woman or the man, whichever one, the Bible said the, this, the sanctified husband sanctifies the wife and vice versa. So now that seed of Christ is passed down to the offspring. That makes the offspring acceptable unto God, holy. The scripture calls it holy. It says they, they are, then are your children born holy. Now, I don't know of anything that's born holy that is discarded by God. However, you can be born holy, you can get saved, you can get saved, and you can get filled with three or four Holy Ghosts. If you don't live holy, you're going to hell. If you don't live holy, you're going to hell. Now, that's just the Bible. So, yes, you can, you can, be, you can be born a righteous seed. It's called the righteous seed. You can be born of the righteous seed, but you still got to choose to serve God. You got to choose to serve God. And if you're born of the righteous seed, it is the responsibility of the parents to teach you in the way of holiness. And you know, when the scripture said, when the scripture said, train up a child in the way he ought to go, and when he is old, he won't depart therefore from, he wasn't really talking about unsaved people. You know what I mean? He, was, he wasn't really talking about training them up, training up unsaved folks. He, he's considering that our righteous seed, you know, I know this was an old, Old Testament um, scripture, but when we bring it over to the New Testament, he's talking about the church. He's talking about husbands and wives in the church, train up your children in the admonition of holiness so that they, when they get older, they won't depart too far from that, and that'll, it'll draw them back because the seed is in them. The seed is, is, is in them. But if a seed is not in a child, a child go where you want to go. He has nothing to convict him. But think about some of our children. No matter what they do, glory to God, they can be off the chain. They get out there in the, in the world. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, one of the saints over in the Mississippi church, her little boy, her little boy went into, was coming, I think, I, I'm, I'm trying to get the story right. Her little boy was coming home from school one day or whatever. He must be just an early teenager, 13, 12, 13, 14 years old, whatever. He's coming home from school one day with his backpack on and him and a couple of other guys. And so they stop at a, at a, at a um, store because he had to go to the bathroom. So he gives his backpack to one of the kids and tell, them, tell the guy to hold his backpack while he goes to the bathroom. So he goes to the bathroom. When he comes back, walks out of the store with his backpack, the boy has taken, stolen something and put it in the backpack. 
Of course, the buzzer goes off and everything, and they, they snatch him, take him back there in the back room, and he's sitting, he's in the back room. He started praying. Jesus, Jesus, you know I didn't do it. Jesus, Jesus, you know I didn't do it. Because you know his mama going to kill him. <laughs> he knew his mother was going to get the butter from the duck. So he's back there just, the, 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 the security guard said so he's just back there just praying. Call it on the name of Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I need you, Jesus, Jesus. <laughs> Please tell my mama. Show my mama. You, you the God that knows all things. Show my mama <laughs> that I did not do this. I did not do this. So oftentimes we think our children are not listening to us. That's why they, those kids need to be listening. Make those kids listen. Glory to God. If they, amen, if, if, if we stay too long and they fall asleep in church, let them fall asleep right there. Glory to God, because at least we, they list, their spirit is listening. Even when they fall asleep, the spirit is listening. But bring those children to church. Don't leave them home for the television to raise them. Amen? Praise the Lord. Question. Are we learning? Praise the Lord. Now we only looked at one one we only looked at one line of this. We looked at one verse of, of scripture tonight. As I, I, I want this to be discipleship. I want to piecemeal this in you. I want us to come out. I want us to come out and 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 hear what God is saying so we can we can get this inside of us. Um get this word inside of us so we'll know, we'll know the word. We want to know the word like we know our name. Isn't that right? We want to know the word like we know our name. Any questions? And I don't want to take you too fast on this. I, I just want you to get one little bit at a time. One little piece at a time. So we understand positional change now. We understand what made it physical. You got that? See, because when you talk to people, I want you to talk with a, with a degree of intelligence. I want you to talk with a degree of intelligence. I got about five more minutes here. Let's see. Glory to God. Where do we stop now? All right, now we were talking about uh, our Colossians 1.15. That's our base scripture, right? And I said that we should start reading. We, re we started from the 12th, the 12th verse, giving thanks unto God, which made us meant to be partakers of inheritance with the, of the saints in light, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Okay, this kingdom of Christ, describe the kingdom of Christ to me. If you live in the kingdom, what is it? What is this kingdom? What is this kingdom of Christ? How, how, how does it look? How can I identify the kingdom? What is the identity of the kingdom of Christ? The kingdom of God. This kingdom of his son. The kingdom of his son. How do I identify this kingdom of his son? Gentlemen, do I hear anything back there? How do I identify the kingdom of his son? Yes, sir. Is huh? By attributes. Whose attributes? Hmm. Well, what were you going to say in the back back there? It's anything that's a part of his spirit. Meaning, um, once you're in his, once you're in Christ, in the Holy Spirit, then you are part of the kingdom. That's what the kingdom looks like. What does it look like? Holiness. Like. Yes, sir?
Hmm. Give me a simple, a simple description of the kingdom of the son. He said the kingdom of his dear son. I need a simple description. Stop thinking so much. Let's just, let's just, come on, let's just, this, let's keep the power, the, the mystery of Christ is found in simplicity. Theologians made it complicated. The mystery of Christ is in simplicity. Yes, sir. Um, I would say the kingdom of Christ is Christ living in these mortal bodies. All right. In the earth. Yes, that's the kingdom of his son. Come on now. That's the kingdom of the son. Christ living where? In all of these bodies here. How many of you have Christ in you? How many of you actually born again? Raise your hand if you're really truly born again. That's the kingdom. I'm looking at the kingdom now. I am looking at the kingdom. When I see you, I see the kingdom. See, we cannot be timid about this. Because the scripture says, as he is, so are we in this world. It didn't say that. So if Jesus can say, if he was our example now, if he was, if he was our example in every sense of the definition of example, when Jesus said, when, Jesus, when, when someone said, show us the Father, and the Father responded, did he not? He said, have I been so long with you and you don't know me? I've been all this time with you and you still don't know me. Was not the Father speaking through Christ? Hello? So God was living in that body. Is that right? Was not God in Christ's body? Okay, is God in your body? Hello? See, the devil don't want you to embrace that. He doesn't because there's power in the knowledge of that. That God is actually living in our mortal bodies. The same God that set the heavens and the earth, that made everything that it is, lives in this mortal body. That's why I don't have no right to take it into sin, because it's his temple. This is his tabernacle now. This is the kingdom of God. This is the kingdom of Christ. This is the kingdom of his son living in our mortal bodies. Now, what does that say? That, what does that mean? That means that, oh, my God, when I've seen you, I've seen God. I've seen Jesus. I've seen him because I'm going to see him. That's, how is the world going to see him except they look upon us? Did not, what, isn't that not what Peter and, and James said? Look upon us. We don't have any silver and gold. But such as we have, we'll give you. What did they have? They had Christ on the inside. They had Christ living on the inside of them. So what was happening? They were looking at the kingdom of Christ. That's what that, the beggar at the gate called beautiful. He was looking at the kingdom of the son of God. When he looked upon them, he was looking at the kingdom. Just like, just like God, Jesus said to Nicodemus. He said, you can't even see the kingdom. Except you be born again, you can't even see it. You don't even know it exists. He was looking at the kingdom of God and didn't know it. He thought he was looking at a teacher. Are you hearing God? Yes, question. Someone else had a question? I thought I saw a hand. Are we learning? So we, do we understand the kingdom of God now? We understand the kingdom? Hello? Praise the Lord. All right. Clap your hands and tell him thank you then. You can do him better than that. Saints, I want to introduce to you um, Pastor Eric uh, from Michigan. Praise the Lord. Visiting with us tonight. Pastor Eric. Amen. It would be robbery if we didn't hear something from him. Pass Pastor Eric a mic if he wants to address us tonight. Praise the Lord, everybody. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, everybody. The scripture says, I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praises shall continuously be in my mouth. I've learned in my life two things. 
when I want to praise God and when I don't, huh. I've got to praise God. Amen. And I thank God for being here. I thank God for the sister inviting me out tonight. And I definitely enjoyed it. And I definitely learned something. Even as a pastor, we need to get fed as well. Amen. So, praise the Lord. Bless you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Bless the Lord. Amen. All right. Glory to God. This has been a real good discussion. Now, um, we start at 7. We're supposed to start at 7 o'clock with prayer. We start teaching at 7.30. Amen? We're not going to We're not gonna schedule our teaching for 7.30 and start at 8 o'clock. We, we scheduled the teaching to start at 7.30. We're going to start teaching at 7.30. Is that, is that understandable? But I do want everyone to come out for prayer at 7. When we have services on Tuesday and Friday nights, I want everybody, especially you leaders, get out here for prayer. But this is lay members as well. We need to pray together those 30 minutes before service. Let's get in here and pray. Is that okay? Because if we can get here by 8, we can get 8, 8.30, glory to God, or 8 o'clock or 7.30, we can get here at 7. Bless the Lord. Unless it's a dire emergency or something, you can't do it. Let's try to get here because we need to come together and let us pray more. I'm going to be taking the church up on a... Uh, fast very soon, glory to God. I'm, I'm thinking about the week before the School of the Prophets. I'm thinking about that week to give everybody two weeks to get themselves together. I may, if, if, not, if, if not that week, next week. Well, we got three weeks before School of Prophets? Amen. If not that week, next week. So I'm, I'm torn between next week and the week before the School of Prophets. So prepare yourselves to fast. Amen. We're going up before the Lord. We're going to sit before God, and we're going to hear what God has to say. I thank God for Indian Town being with us. Come on, let's give God a praise for that. <laughs> Amen. Glory to God. Now, um, we're going to worship God not giving. I want you to prepare yourself to give. And we can worship God not giving. But saints, Friday night, this coming Friday night, we're going to have global praise here at the, Amen. So Indian Town, glory to God. I, I need, I need, I need, um, I want to see the, the, the youth, I want to see the, the youth come together and, and um, do some um, dance. I want to see, I need a praise team here. I need a, I need some, I need some real um, singing Friday night. We're going to have global praise Friday night. Amen. Amen. So I want us to dress up Friday night and get ready for global praise. We're going to we're going to be beaming. We're going to go live on BTBN. We're going to be live on the television network all throughout the um, Caribbean and over here in the states on the Roku and and the internet. So we're going to be live. So all our cable networks are going to be carrying us down there in uh, the in the Caribbean and uh, the Roku here. And all of the other the all the other devices that that our television network is is been able to, to uh, is is uh, positioned on, so let's let's be prepared for global praise. Uh, Brother Yannick will 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 be getting with you guys. He's going to be setting it up for me. He and um, Daniel are going to be setting up setting something in place for global praise. Um, basically, him and um, Amy, because Daniel and I got work, other work to do. Praise God. But Letitia, Amen. Let's let's get let's get let's get something ready. Global praise. And I want I want you I want you guys looking your best. So I'll I'll give you the format. Glory to God. I'll give you the format tomorrow. You know, so we can get ready for it. Amen. Now, so today is Tuesday. I think we need to meet again before Tuesday, though. What do you think? I'm going to hear from Leesburg. Leesburg. Are you guys want to you want a day off tomorrow and come back Thursday, or you want to come back tomorrow night and be off Thursday and come back Friday? Leesburg, I'm talking to you. Rather do it tomorrow. Yes, praise the Lord. Well, this is what I'm going to do. I'm not going to. I'm not going to put any, any. Um, I'm not going to put any any pressure on you. 
Um, but I will tell you this, Indian Town is here. These young people came down. They want to be. A, they came down to help us get everything ready and shape for the School of Prophets. But while they're here, they also want to be. They want to sit up under discipleship. So we're going to be having sessions here tomorrow evening. If you come, you come. If you don't, you don't. But we're going to be here having discipleship sessions. You know, just group sessions. Amen. Glory to God. So, but we will be here formally Friday night. Friday night. I have some young people here that are that are going to be ministering. Amy, Amy is here to minister. Um, Yannick is here to minister. Glory to God. So I don't have to do all the ministering tomorrow night. So young people, get on out here. Old people, get on out here. And let's, let's you know, if you want to sit around and, and let's, let's um, do some discipleship. Let's do some discipleship. Like a, like a good old shut-in. Remember how we used to do the shut-ins? Amen. Let's, let's just come out. Don't, it, no, no, no pressure. Just if you, if you feel like you want to, get more versed in the, in the word, glory to God, then come on out. Amen? Bless the Lord. That's during the night because during the day we're working. We're working here. We've got, I really need all of the outside cleaned up. I hope we're not online. Huh? Are we? Are we still online? Huh? Huh? Well, for those of you that are online, if you, amen, from another location, amen, if, you're, um, if you want to come on up and help us out and get the Global Training Center ready for School of the Prophets, then come on up, glory to God. And, and while you're there, I know you enjoyed the lesson tonight, so go to our donation page and click on donation and give a donation for the, um, for the service tonight. We love you. This is Dr. Banks saying we'll see you next time. Amen. <laughs>